Okay, guys, so what are we doing here today? Why, why did I call you all here? Uh, because I wanted to have you over to my house and um, invite you over to meet my friend Redshift. Redshift is, is a, a renderer for Cinema 4D. It's, you know, Houdini, Maya, everything else. I've been using it for a, over a year now, I think. Uh, in its beta and its alpha and its alpha beta omega and all the different crazy other words that, that it's, it's kind of been through. Well, now um, it's officially out and people, uh, I've been told by the fine folks at Redshift that I can start to show you guys some of the stuff that I've been playing with and what I like about it and what I've learned. Um, and I'm excited about that. So that's what this is. This is me having you over to my house, letting you shake Redshift's hand and say, hey, what's up Redshift, how you doing? All right, so here we are. We're in Cinema 4D. I don't even have Redshift set up as my renderer yet. And I've got this wacky window over here, and I've got this toolbar over here. And yes, I'm going to approach this from a very beginner standpoint at first, because there's some people in here that are, you know, just heard about it, haven't seen it. Maybe they downloaded the demo, but really haven't played with it much. So if you're coming from GPU rendering, um, namely Octane, uh, this is going to be quite a bit different. So you're gonna have to learn some fundamental differences between how these how they work. Uh, it's also quite different from other renderers like Physical or Arnold and, and whatnot. So let's just begin at the beginning. We need to officially just load Redshift up as our, uh, as our renderer. So I'm gonna choose a renderer, I'm gonna choose Redshift and you can immediately see we have a quite a, a pretty long list of settings and and this can be kind of intimidating right it's 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 kind of a lot of stuff in here a lot of little drop downs there's something called russian roulette which still to this day scares me so i don't touch it uh we've got memory and system and all that sort of thing got a lot going on uh before before i dive into actually rendering a frame and, and like making it go for the first time, I do feel like I should tell you that I'm running a pretty beefy PC with four GTX 980 Ti's in it. So if you see my IPR going faster than yours or maybe slower, hey man, my cards are pretty old, so it wouldn't surprise me. Um, that you got to take that new account. It's a GPU renderer. It's NVIDIA CUDA only. So the more NVIDIA CUDA core cores that you've got the faster it will go all right so just wanted to like lay that out there before i hit go on this okay so right now i have redshift set up my as my renderer and if you go into the redshift tab here or the redshift menu you can see we have this ipr and render view and that's probably confusing to people well don't worry, the IPR is actually, if you open that up, it's the same thing as the render view, only the render view is actually newer. So the render view is sort of the future of the, of the IPR window. Uh, it's got more settings, it's got more doodads. I'll kind of walk you through that. So if you're using the IPR, that's totally fine. You can still use it, it's still adequate. I personally prefer to use the, uh, the render view which I have docked over here. And I can, I'll actually share this layout afterwards. Maybe if everybody sticks around, maybe I'll upload this layout and everybody can check it out if they dig it. Okay, so we've got a shader ball. We've got no materials in here. The first thing that I think anybody would do would just to be hit play on the IPR and, and watch it go. Uh, you can see it's a progress, it's in progressive mode right now. And you're probably thinking, well, okay, cool. So it's progressive renderer, right? No, okay, so this is the, biggest thing that I've been trying to like explain to people that are new to Redshift or uh, maybe they're just looking at it. So there's bucket mode and there's progressive mode. Okay, so why are there two different modes? What is the deal with that? Well, the biggest, the, here's why it's important. Bucket mode is what you're going to render your final frames with. It's what's going to uh, give you buckets, just like in Arnold, right? Um, if I, in fact, if I come over and I'll explain how to do it in the render view in a minute, but I think it's important to see it in the actual render settings, right? So we have progressive rendering and right now it's forced enabled on for IPR. So that means it's progressively rendering this frame. If I were to move the camera 
uh, I don't know, like orbit a little bit. You can see, actually, this out of the way. You can see it's it's pretty uh, dang, um, well, it should be responsive, but it's actually not being responsive for me. Let me refresh it. All right, here we go. Come on, baby. Oh, man, the Redshift guys are going to be mad. Oh, you know why? I think it's because I have cam lock on. Sometimes, and I'll walk you through this in a minute, but okay, so you could see, I just wanted to show you how responsive it is, and I'm sure, you know, the Twitch stream is probably not ideal, but I'm just orbiting, and I'm getting like 50, you know, 60 FPS, and it's doing a really good job keeping up with me right now. Um, it's, it's pretty dang responsive, and I'm not seeing much grain. I'm not seeing much much uh it doesn't have to resolve very hard right now it's it has a default light right now there's no lights in here again i just wanted to kind of show you that and so another thing if i open up these globals here if i'm in progressive mode which i am right now uh i can actually change how many passes i get in this progressive mode basically limiting how many passes the progressive mode will go through and i like to keep this pretty low i like to keep it like 128 because when i'm doing progressive I don't necessarily need it to resolve on the cleanest image. That's because the IPR and progressive mode are for doing look dev. They're for doing planning. They're for like building shaders and checking out your lighting and doing all that sort of stuff, right? They're not for rendering out your frames, okay? I'm gonna beat that into everybody's brains. Progressive mode is for look dev. Bucket mode is what you're gonna Render out for your clients, okay? So that's the difference there. Really, really important difference. And that's why it's important that the render view has the ability to switch from bucket mode to progressive mode just with this little button right here that kind of looks like a bunch of buckets. So if I switch this over, it's really went pretty fast. I bet you didn't actually even see it. But when I go into bucket mode, I'm now using the bucket mode. So if I, let me just go ahead and like, give this a lot more samples, and this is not really gonna make a whole lot of sense for you right now, but I'll kind of go over this stuff in a minute, but I just wanted to be able to show you, and these are horrible settings, I wouldn't recommend using these anyway, I just wanted you to see these buckets go. That was my point. So right now I'm in bucket mode, right? So I use bucket mode when I'm ready to start to really kind of fine tune my render, maybe check out my AOVs, maybe uh, get that final quality idea of what it's gonna look like, maybe prep it, start to optimize it to go out the door, that sort of thing. But when I'm being creative and I'm lighting and I'm building shaders and whatnot, I'm almost always in progressive mode because that's going to be a much more interactive kind of way to work, okay? So we haven't created any lights. We haven't done anything yet. I just wanted to, number one, get that out of the way so that you understand what progressive and bucket mode are and why you should use one or the other, okay? So uh, when you're in... IPR and you're in, when you're in the render view and you've got your IPR going and you're in progressive mode None of these none of these samples are really going to make any difference So the unified sampling which is really the 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 best part about redshift is the unified sampling It's a biased renderer. Okay, which means that it's just it, it cheats. It's not it doesn't it makes no apologies It cheats. Okay, it's not a unbiased path tracer it cheats and that's good for production okay that's why i love it because i like a renderer that i can bend and twist to my will and make it as fast as i possibly can and forget everything else that i'm not using path tracing is great it has its place but in production i'd prefer to be able to bend a renderer around my will to get it to do what i want it to do okay so generally um when i'm testing a render for the first time again i'm going to close this down and um, when I'm trying to render for the first time, usually the first thing I do is try to get some image-based lighting going. So uh, for that in, in Redshift, you're gonna be using the dome light. So I'm gonna go over the little light bulb tab over here, the little light bulb button. And you've got all your different light types, which we're not gonna get into too heavily, all these other different types, but I am gonna grab the dome light. And you can see instantly when I create a dome light, uh, let me hide my psych object here it immediately uh, loads white, just like any other dome light uh, in any other renderer, right? But what I love about their dome light is just the, the sheer amount of controls you have with it. And um, I'm gonna do like a shameless plug here for HDRI Link because I, I really, 
I do use it every day. Uh, of course, you can load any HDRI into the path here and change the map type. But for our demo, I'm going to go ahead and load in HDRI link. And if it didn't just crash, which, oh my God, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be something? I think I'm, I think it actually did. I think it actually crashed. Oh, nope. It was just trying real hard to do something. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, that really, ha I was sweating there for a minute, guys. I gotta tell you. All right, so the HDRI link tag is over there. I'm gonna go ahead and drag dome map onto the tag. And let's just grab that tag and tell it to load a lower resolution preview mode, okay? And I'm gonna double click the tag to open up my browser here. Do, do, do. Let's just grab something uh, from the commercial locations and we'll grab this guy, okay? So why, why do I like this dome map or this dome light so much? Because it's got a lot of really cool uh, little features in it. And by the way, in case you're keeping score, I have no GI going on right now. And I'm just gonna kind of zoom in here and you can see how responsive that is. And as soon as I mouse up, it's it's resolved on a clean image. I'm not sure how, how that's coming through the stream, but it is ridiculously fast. And, I, and I'm still, I'm in progressive IPR. Like this is not, there's not a whole lot going on right now in the scene. I know that, but it is pretty damn fast. Okay, so let's just toggle down here. We have control over exposure for, for the HDRI. So let's go ahead and bring that up a little bit. You also have the ability, and this is unique and I really like it. I like having the saturation control in my dome light because we've all seen those those HDRIs that are too blue. Like they, they basically, uh, they exposed it maybe incorrectly or maybe the white balance is off and, the, and you end up with like a completely blue uh, render because your HDRI is blue. That's fine. You can actually just toggle the. You just start to walk the saturation down of your of your dome light right here, and that's awesome. What you can also do is you can also obviously turn off the background and turn it back on. But you also have the ability to load a backplate right in here. I'm not going to do that right now. But if I wanted to, I could load in a backplate, and it would all be contained in my dome light. So this is great if you're doing like a CG object in a live action plate or something. It's perfect for that. There's all sorts of controls for it. I just, I really like it a lot. It's, it's actually, uh, let's go ahead and turn that off so we can see it. It's a fantastic uh, dome light. And I've, I've used lots of different dome lights and lots of different programs. And this is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, so we have, you notice here it says samples. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute, but I just really wanted to walk you through the first things that I usually do is like I load up a, an image-based lighting scenario like this, a dome light, and maybe I'll like load in a, a ground. I'll keep everything pretty default. And then I'll start to turn on the GI and see what happens. So let's just do that. So let's go over to our, our render globals here, our render settings. I'm gonna go under GI and you can see right now um, I've got nothing, got no, no primary GI, no secondary GI. So first of all, if you've used V-Ray or, well, V-Ray is probably the closest match to this sort of scenario. It's very similar to V-Ray. In V-Ray, when I was using it in 3ds Max, I would be a brute force light cache type of person. Like that's what I would always kind of default to is my primary secondary. And in Redshift, I kind of do the same thing. I do brute force and my secondary is almost always going to be irradiance point cloud. Okay. Right now we've got a pretty low amount of bounces. We've only got three. So I might bring this up to, I don't know, how many do you really need? Six is probably fine for what we've got going in this. Uh, and then you can see right down here, we've got number array 16. I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this a little bit more detail in a minute, but right now I just wanted to get some GI cooking and we've got our default shaders, nothing else really going on. I'm gonna go ahead and increase the exposure of my dome light and make it a little bit brighter. Something like that, it's probably good. So now we got some light bouncing around the floor. We actually have some GI cooking, so that's looking good. Okay, so what? let's let's make a material. Like I wanna, that's the, usually the second thing I do is I try to make some sort of material really quickly. So let's grab a redshift over here. We're gonna grab a material. Now you'll notice there's a lot of different redshift materials. There's car paint, which is actually really rad car paint shader. Uh, skin, particle, volume, blah, blah, blah. Uh, most of the time, you're just going to be using their Uber shader, which is the material. So with this material, I'm going to go ahead and dump this onto my shader ball. And you're going to immediately see that we have uh, some reflections going on. We've got some plastic looking material going on. Um, so let's, let's just take a moment here. I'm not going to dive into the shaders just yet. Now I feel like we have something where we can talk a little bit more about this render view. 
because this render view, there's a lot of buttons here, and these buttons are really, really useful. Uh, so what do they do? So this first one is actually, if you mouse over it, um, it just tells you what it's going to do. It says, I'm going to render. So that's going to actually kick off a render from, from the render view. I'm not going to touch that one because it'll actually launch up a render and whatnot. You got your play, you got your pause, which is basically initializing and uninitializing the, the IPR. You have this little uh, refresh, which is just going to send the scene again to the IPR. Uh, then you have a drop down here. This is all your channels. Well, right now, if you if you notice, I've only got beauty here. Uh, I am in I am in progressive mode, and you need to remember that are there are certain things that just aren't going to be visible in progressive mode, and AOVs are one of them. So I if I wanted to see if I had AOVs, which I don't yet. If I wanted to see my AOVs, I could not be in progressive mode. I would have to come over here and switch to bucket mode. All right, so moving over, we've got RGB. We can just toggle these red, green, blue, and then back to the alpha, and then it back to the RGB. We can also fly these down. You also have this little crop, which you can actually initialize that way and drag, uh, drag the corners around to wherever you want. Or if you're like me, you can just hold down shift and just drag. And now you've got the ability to come in here and kind of render region out a specific area of your, of your frame, which is really handy. Uh, let's go click off that. And we have the lock camera, which uh, sometimes that can mess you up if you forget that it's there. Like, let's just go out to uh, top view. Um, so sometimes you'll be working and you'll be like, oh, shoot, yeah, you know what? I forgot to lock my camera down. So I, I try to get into the habit of, of locking my camera down as soon as I start my IPR session. Uh, we already talked about switching between bucket mode and progressive mode. We've got a little snowflake here, which is freeze tessellation. So I'll walk you through this uh, maybe in a future video. This one's, I don't want this one to go too long, but with the redshift tag, you have the ability to do um, like subdivision surface, uh, you know, screen space subdivision surface type stuff where it smooths it out based on how far away from the camera your object is. And what that does is it freezes the tessellation of those objects so that it's not constantly calculating and slowing down your IPR session. Okay, the other next uh, kind of most important one that I use probably... Uh, about as much as I use the uh, start IPR is this one over here, the render modes. So the render modes, if I toggle this little fly down, you have the ability to do regular, clay, and samples. So for the most part, I'm in regular most of the time, but occasionally I'll go into clay. And what that does is it kind of throws a white clay material on everything. This is a great way to check to see if your fill to light, you know, your key to fill ratio is looking good and your lighting is looking right. The color temperature is where you want it to be. And then you can dive back into regular. Uh, the next one down is called samples. And I'm going to talk about that in depth a little bit later, because that's going to be a really important mode right there. The next one you have over here is the ability to do snapshots. Now, the snapshots is, is kind of the RV's way of saving uh, to the picture viewer. So if I turn this on, it's going to like open up this little dialog. And if I go ahead and click this down to a snapshot, it loads it down here. I don't really use this, to be honest, because I have this little cool button send to PV, which basically just sends whatever you have in your IPR to the picture viewer. So you can do your A-B tests. You can, you know, go, oh, let me look at that one. Let me look at this one. And that's just a, a better way to handle that. If I keep going over this way, you have all the different size options. So if we could do original size, which is just going to say, well, this is an HD frame. Uh, and it's it's cropping it right now. So this is like whatever it is, like if I come over here and say outputs 1920 by 1080, that's what it's showing me right there. I can always do fixed scaling too, which is kind of where I usually am. So I'm looking at 100% scale and 40% of my render output size right here. If I go down to fit window, it's pretty obvious that it's just going to fit into the render view and I can resize the render view and it will adjust accordingly. I can also do fill window, which is going to take uh, whatever edge it, it that's kind of hanging off the render view and just fill it. Just kind of like if you had your TV and you, you know, letterbox and, you know, set to fill or zoom or whatever. Uh, I typically, like I said, I use this at fixed scaling just because I like that control. And this is why, because if you're working on a very specific part of an object, let's say this highlight right here uh, of the shader, and I really want to see what that shader is doing, what I'll do is I'll change my, uh, my actual output size to like 250%. So now, if you notice, uh, let me just reposition myself over here. 
I can actually go higher than that too. Actually, let me go 500%. So this is not, um, right now I'm just scaling this, right? So this is just, I'm just literally blowing up the image, which is why it looks kind of, it looks kind of ratty. That's not really how I would probably want to work like that. I would probably want to work at like 100%, right? And let's just go ahead and frame this up again. And I drag my render region over the area that I'm working. And then I would change this, this output percent to 250. So now if you look, uh, let me just kind of frame over here. If it, yep, there it goes. Uh, come on, baby. Come on. Oh man, it's super lag all of a sudden. Uh, there it is, okay. So now you can see that I'm actually doing 250% of my output. So 250% of 1920 by 1080. Uh, and that way I can really kind of hone in on just a little piece of, of my frame. And I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to zoom in. I don't have to come over to my output settings and change that, all that sort of thing. So it just makes it a lot easier. So let's just go back down to 60. And oops, uh, turn that off. And let's go ahead and reframe here. Good. And let's make this 100%. Cool. And I think I had it at like 55. Yeah, I think it was something like that. And I'm just going to render region around my shader balls so it's a little bit easier. Okay, so the next one over is the settings, which has some pretty cool features. Uh, you have the ability to kind of mouse over and see what all the pixel data you have in your image is. Uh, you have the ability to change the snapshots folder. We're not really using that. Uh, but one of my favorite things is that you can come down here and you can actually load a LUT in here, so which that's pretty rad. So if you haven't checked out Gorilla Grade LUTs, we have a whole set of look LUTs that you can buy on our website. And you can actually load them in here. In fact, you could like, you know, change this to like 2.2 and then come over to the LUT and you could like navigate to a LUT. I'm not going to do it right now, but you could actually get some pretty pretty rad looks that way. Uh, let's go back to sRGB. Cool. All right. So let's close that down. So that's the render view kind of in a nutshell. And uh, again, we're, we've been in progressive mode this whole time. So let's, let's switch it over to bucket mode. So now we're going to be in bucket mode. But you know what? I'm getting tired. I'm kind of, I, I think this shader ball is kind of boring. So I'm going to open up a different scene. I'm going to grab this robot, which I think is way cooler uh, than than a, a shader ball. So we've got this robot and you can get this robot from Turbo Squid. Uh, I'll link it in the uh, show notes uh, where you can pick it up. I mean, dude, look how, f that's pretty responsive. I mean, it is like, I'm not seeing, I don't know if it's coming through, but there's no grain when I'm like orbiting and whatnot. I mean, yeah, Octane is super fast and like the response time in Octane is probably even a little bit faster, but this does not even need to converge. It's so quick. All right, so let's just go through that same steps again. I'm going to grab a dome light. I'm going to throw the HDRI link tag on it, and hopefully it won't die, and we're going to put it in here. Cool. And let's go ahead and make it preview. Awesome. And the next thing I'm going to do is find that same map that I like. Cool, there it is. And let's turn on a background. All right, so now we have this little cove, this little background going here. It's pretty dim still. I'm actually going to bring this up to maybe two, something like that. All right, so let's get out of let's get out of this uh, progressive mode. Let's pretend uh, that we're going to start to render this out for real. And now I can actually kind of explain to you some of the meat of the of the samples and and what all this stuff means. But first, let's take a sip of coffee. Ah. Uh. Very good. All right, so um, let's open up our render settings. Let's go under Redshift. Now I'm going to switch from progressive to bucket. So now we are in bucket mode, and you can see if you notice that did a little uh, irradiance, uh, a little irradiance pass there, which is the irradiance point cloud. You can turn that off. You don't have to actually watch that if you don't want to. Uh, I'm also going to bring everything down pretty dang low. In fact, let's turn off all of the GI for right now. And I'm going to just start to walk around my settings and walk you through how I like to work with Redshift. Okay, so like I said before, Redshift strength is the unified sampling. Uh, and that is all kind of done right here. 
right? It, it, these these are probably the the three most important uh, sliders you're going to find in Redshift right here: the samples min and max, and then the adaptive threshold. So what what's happening right now? I've got a pretty low min and a you know medium medium max, but I'm going to actually turn them off. I'm going to say one and one, and I'm going to change my ah that's fine. I'll actually leave the threshold there. So why did I do that? Why did I why did I just bring my min and max sample down to one? That surely can't be enough uh, samples. Uh, it's not. And the reason that I did that is because you have to start thinking about sampling in a different way. You have to start thinking about putting samples where they matter, putting samples where they're needed. And if you look at my frame right now, I've got a lot of grain. And why is that? Well, the unified sampling isn't doing any any work here. It's not it's not having to. I've, I've told it to use a min and max of one. So that means if I'm seeing grain right now and I've got GI turned off, that means that this dome light probably needs more samples, right? So I'm just going to render region over this grain down here, and I'm going to go under my dome light, and we're going to give it more samples. And you always want to try to give Redshift samples in powers of two. It's just from what I've been reading, it's just easier for the for the math the algorithms and whatnot. So I'm just going to hit times two on the 64. And now that's at 128. That's a little cleaner. I think we're going to have to go higher. So let's go times two again, 256. That's a little cleaner. Let's go times two again. And now we're at 512. That's pretty dang clean, but I bet we could go one more. So two. So now we've got 1,024 samples in this dome light, and now it's clean. So if I actually just uncheck the... Uh, uh, the, the crop there, you can see it kind of converge over the whole image. And you can see how fast that was. It was done in seconds. So you're saying to yourself, wow, that's a crazy, that's a lot of samples. Like that's way more samples than I've ever had to put in anything in my entire career. Well, you know, that's the idea here. So you, you don't, you don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to put a ridiculously what you think is a ridiculously high number of samples because it it actually um, it's actually not that many when you when you consider how Redshift is working okay so that I've kind of figured out and we've got our we've got a clean render going there let's turn on some GI now let's go ahead and turn on uh, brute force and I'm just gonna leave it one pass and I feel like yeah it's a bit grainy it's kind of hard for you to see but let me um, let me actually Get you like 150 percent actually let's go 200 percent and blow this up over here so you can kind of see this grain a little bit better we're going to clean that up by shooting more rays into our brute force again we're going to go powers of two so times two that's not going to be enough i already know this is not going to be enough so i'm going to go 256 and see if that looks any better i'm just going to region out this little area that's definitely not going to be enough so let's go ahead and times two on that and let's even go even further that's a that's a little bit better, okay? So let's go two on that. Now we're at 2048, and I feel like that is pretty clean. And let's go ahead and regionize, turn off that render region. Great. All right, so this is looking pretty good, but you're saying to yourself, I've seen, I'm seeing some jaggies over here. Uh, well, that's because that's actually going to be taken care of by the, uh, the actual unified sampling is going to handle a lot of that for us. So let's start introducing some min-max here. So... What is the min doing? What is the max doing? It's it's number of rays, I believe. Um, there, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna show you guys. A, a, I made like a whole YouTube, uh, like not a channel but a playlist uh, filled with all sorts of amazing tutorials by people far smarter than me that explain these things in a far more scientific manner than I will. But and you know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. So min, I'm actually gonna bring this up to eight. And max, uh, oops, sorry, the max I'm actually going to bring up to 16, and the min I'm going to bring up to 8. And let's bring this back down to 100%. And you can see now it's much cleaner, right? So what is happening here? What, 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 what is this stuff? I don't understand the min, the max. What is this, like, number of samples? Okay, well, how does that work? Well, the easiest way to kind of visualize what's happening here is, remember when I said I was going to get back to the samples mode? 
Well, that's what you want to turn on. You want to turn on samples mode, right? And immediately you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, what the hell is this? This looks crazy. Well, it's actually not crazy. It's actually really, really smart. And it, it's a really great way to visualize where Redshift is thinking about the image. So right now, anything that's white is getting my max amount of samples. And anything that is darker or as close to black as you can get will be getting the min. Now, it's not very dark back here because we have a pretty... Uh, a pretty small range of where these pixels could fall. So if I increase this max, like you'd think to yourself, well, if I increase the max, it's going to make the render times go up, right? Well, false. So if I bring this to like 256, you're going to notice that the render time gets faster. And now we're starting to see a little bit more dark areas in our image. We're starting to see uh, where Redshift is not necessarily thinking that much about parts of the image. And if you if you remember, we put all of our samples where they belonged. We put our samples in our dome light and in our GI. And if we had, uh, and I'll show you the material in a minute, but if we had stuff going on like glossies in the material, we'd be putting samples in there too. So if you put samples where they belong, then the unified sampling has to work a lot less hard. A lot less harder? Yeah. Okay. So what's happening with the, with the ad adaptive error threshold? If I bring this up to, let's say, 0.05, it's basically saying my threshold for being able to see what's falling in in this range or where I should where Redshift is saying like okay should I give this pixel uh, the max amount of samples should I give it the lowest this threshold is going to make that decision so a really low threshold is going to assume that more things should be getting the max amount of samples and the higher it is let's say like 0.1 the more likely it's going to say, ah, you know what, you're cool. I'm going to give you the min. I think you look pretty good. I'm, I'm going to leave you alone. Uh, I'm just going to actually, for this demo, leave it pretty, pretty basic setting. And um, yeah, I think this actually looks pretty good. In fact, I might bring the, mat, the min up a little bit just to get a little bit more smoothness out of this. And obviously, if, when you're doing min max, the only time, or sorry, the, the times that you'll want to get really high with these numbers is when you're doing any sort of depth of field, uh, motion blur, things of that nature, you'll probably have to go a lot higher than, than what I'm going right here. All right, so let's get back into our regular mode. And there it is. And it's rendering it pretty, pretty damn fast. In fact, let's go ahead and change our setting to fit window. We have, let's see, how many bounces? Oh, we don't even have our secondary engine on. So let's go ahead and turn on our secondary GI engine and we'll give it six bounces and a uh, number of brute force rays we already fixed that that's all good i'm not going to touch any of the other settings and there you go it's it finished it in oh man it didn't actually print uh how long it took but it was like seconds right all right so let's get let's uh i feel like i've got i, I gave you a pretty broad stroke idea of what's going on there um, but you're, you know, if you're like me, when I kind of figured out how this worked, I was like, oh man, does that mean like I'm going to have to dive into every single light and change the samples? Does that mean I'm going to have to like go into every shader and like tweak it and like try to find it? Uh, and I'm going to open up actually the finished version of this scene because I feel like it'll look cooler when I'm talking about this other stuff. All right, let's let that, let that load for a second. Um, well, the answer is no. You don't have to go in there and, and dive in and literally tweak every single sample setting. They've got this really cool feature right here called sample uh, overrides, sampling overrides. Uh, and that is really a, a powerful way to kind of globally change the sampling that you're, that you're getting. Uh, let's say you have a bunch of materials with uh, refle refle glossy reflections, and you don't want to have to dive into each one. You could say override. Uh, you could easier, either do a, a replace, which is actually going to replace the samples of the glossies with whatever number you type in here. Or you can say scale, which is going to be like a multiplier. In my case, I'm not going to worry about that. But this is a great way, if you have a really complicated scene, to kind of adjust all the light samples at once, all the volume samples, so on and so on. Um, in fact, I think this scene... I don't think I optimized it that well. Yeah, I think it's probably fine for this demo. So um, yeah, so I hope that made sense. And so that's a kind of a great way to not have to worry about diving into each individual light, each individual setting. Uh, I am also going to talk about the Redshift tag, but maybe not today. We're already running. What are we at here? 45 minutes already. 
and I haven't even like really scratched the surface of everything. I'm just, but again, this is just me and you and Redshift shaking hands. Uh, the you're probably yelling through your 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 monitor chat. Show the materials already. Enough enough of this. Just show the materials. Okay, let's do that. Let's. Uh, I'll first. I'll I'll show you the material that's on this uh, this mech. Uh, and the way that you can get to that, you can double click the shader, come over here and hit, hit shader graph. But if you're like me and you like hotkeys, then you can create a hotkey. In my case, I made it control middle click to open up uh, this material. So this is a fairly complicated material for this mech, which um, it's, it's one shader on the entire mech. Uh, and I'm using several different grunge maps. And I know it's like looks kind of crazy. It's really not that crazy. And maybe in a future video, I'll do more of a uh, efficient kind of breakdown of this, but it's all piping into a material blender. And you can see over here to the right, or sorry, the left, you have the ability to search for nodes just like you would in Octane or Arnold. Um, so it's a very uh, robust system. It does use the, uh, the Expresso looking material editor, which also Arnold uses. I know a lot of people are bummed about that, but hey, I've, got, I've gotten used to it. It's really not a big deal for me anymore. Um, all right, so let's just let's grab a new material, and I just want to show you around the material just a little bit because um, again, we're just we're just shaking hands here. That's all we're doing. I'm just replacing this, and I'm actually going to get out of bucket mode and go into progressive mode so that it things move a little bit faster for me. Okay, so we have a this white plastic. I'm going to open up the uh, material here. So um, right off the bat, in the Uber shader. Uh, another thing, another tip for those of you out there, I always turn off the auto refresh previews because uh, this little this little preview right here is actually an instance of Redshift. And if uh, you have a complicated material, sometimes that can slow you down. So I usually turn that off. I've gotten kind of used to not using shader balls to look at my renders or sorry, look at my materials. When I'm doing look dev, I've gotten really used to just looking at the IPR. So I'm just going to regionize my mech and I'm going to walk you through uh, the Uber shader. And then I think we will um, probably have to, gosh, we're going really long. And then we'll maybe open it up to some questions. Uh, so much I didn't have time to cover, but there's always future videos. Okay, so base property tab. This is where you're going to find all your controls for your diffuse, your reflection, your refraction, and uh, the subsurface. And the subsurface, there's a couple of different ways to tackle a subsurface. There's the transmittance kind of method, and then there's also this tab, multi-subsurface, which gives you three layers of subsurface. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite things about Redshift are the presets. I kind of like having a place to start and not have to start from scratch every time or rebuild everything all the time. So it has some pretty nifty presets here. In fact, let's load iron up and it's going to change um, the entire shader uh, to be iron. And uh, it's really pretty rough right now. Let's actually bring the glossiness or sorry, the roughness down so we can see that a little bit better. But you can see how fast it is. It's like pretty ridiculously it's pretty ridiculous how fast this thing is, I gotta, I gotta say. Um, so let's just kind of zoom in on this gun right now. Um, there's a bunch of different methods for doing the BRDF. Um, it kind of defaults to this Cook Torrent Speckman method. You can actually change it to GGX if you want. You can also change the Fresnel type, which is the, the edge. Uh, you can use a advanced IOR, a color plus tint, metalness if you're coming from substance or something like that, or you can just use, use like a straight up IOR. I tend to tend to leave it at the default, or occasionally I'll do an advanced if I you know have the um, the uh, the IOR and the absorption numbers handy. If you're if you want to go that crazy with it, um, for right now I'm going to leave it as is right there. Uh, refra reflection uh, transmission. This is where you're going to make things look like glass. I'm actually, I'm kind of afraid to turn the robot into glass, but hey, well, let's see what happens. Uh, let's do glass, and the whole thing's just going to go crazy because it's refracting my HDRI, but it's pretty damn fast. I mean, you got to you gotta admit, if I do a tinted glass, that's going to give it um, just like, you know, actually, it looks pretty rad. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So now we have like this tinted glass. This is perfect for doing... Uh, marbles, or if you have an object, you can see that it's it's more tinted in the areas that have more of a volumetric, like a thicker volume, and uh, not so much of the tint on the edge of the gun over here. So that's that's out. That's pretty rad. Um, I'm gonna go back into iron, 
And so if we keep scrolling down here, we got the subsurface, which I'm not going to get into today's video. You also have the ability, if I come over to the coding, you can do multi-level uh, specular. So you have two levels of spec, two specular lobes. So let's go back to like a plastic and let's make our plastic kind of a, a black. And I'm going to, for this one, find a different angle. I'm just going to try to find a highlight somewhere, maybe on this tip of this gun right here. Yeah, right here. That, that's about where I want. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and make our first specular uh, lobe a bit rough. So we're going to make this a little bit rough. Um, and then our coating, we're going to turn on. And this is going to be like a little extra spec coating. And I might give this one just a little bit of roughness. And it's going to use the similar IOR. So what this is going to simulate is like a very fine dust or like car paints or whatnot where you have uh, light being broken up on a surface in the first specular but it also has maybe a clear coat on it so it's not completely uh, shiny and it's not completely rough it's just a it's a great way uh, to create realistic plastics and metals in fact i like to use it for for my for my metals uh, let's see if i have this metal in here so i have a these shader balls i think is this might be an actual better way to kind of describe what that's doing so i'm going to create um one of my favorite ways to kind of create a, a metal shader or chromed out kind of metal shader so i'm going to grab a new redshift material put it onto that sphere and let's just go ahead and center up on that guy uh let's go ahead and hide this dude all right let's open this guy up and we're going to give him, we're going to start with that preset of iron. And I'm going to leave this, this defaults with a pretty high roughness, but I'm going to actually bring it down to maybe like a 0.35. And I'm going to come over to my coding and turn my coding weight all the way up. And I'm going to change my IOR of that coding to probably like 10, something fairly high. And now I can sort of walk that value down. And it's so subtle that you at home, I'm not even sure if you'll be able to see it. But what this does is it just kind of creates a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a glossy effect on these highlights that kind of makes it look not so perfect, almost like there's a layer of dust on it or smudges or that sort of thing. So that, that, that coat can really help you nail some of these things. Um, anyway, so let's get back over to our robot and gosh darn it this robot model is so cool again you can get it on turbo squid i'll, I'll put you, I'll put a link in um man i could really just geek out on the shaders on this thing and like show you this whole bot metal material that i made uh but maybe maybe i'll save that for another one but you can see here just so that you're aware of what it's doing um this material is actually using curvature it's using some grunge maps of my own uh, some some gnarly noises and stuff. Uh, you can see it's got like edge wear, which I'm doing with the redshift curvature. Uh, it's a little bit more visible, I think, up here on the face. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's actually pretty rad. Pretty rad angle right there. I'm going to hold that right there, actually. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I've been at this. We're at 51 minutes already. Um I guess the one of the one other thing I'll I want to talk about is depth of field because I think that's another really uh, cool strong thing about Redshift. And again, I want to know what you guys think after we get into the Q and A. I want to know what you want to see more of. I just was like wanted to give you like a broad stroke. Hey, come come check this out, kind of a thing. But really, I want I want to know what you guys want to see. I already have some pretty good ideas of what I want to show you. But all right, let's set up some depth of field on this guy. Uh, let's go ahead and um, delete the camera tag that's already on my camera. So we're looking through this camera here. I'm going to grab tags and I'm going to go down to the Redshift tag and hit Redshift camera. And immediately you can see that we've got a lot of cool little tabs here. We've got exposure, which I'm not going to get into today. You can do some really rad like color mapping type stuff, tone mapping. Bokeh, which is really what we're, where we're going to spend the most of our time in distortion. If you have an, if you've, you know, somebody's given you a distortion map that you want to match a plate with, that's where you'd load that. All right, so let's turn on um, Bokeh. So Bokeh, turning that on. And I'm going to go ahead in my camera and choose my focal Oh, I actually already have a focal object in here. It looks like this null right here. Where is that null? Let me go ahead and move this null to his face. All right. Uh, yep. And I forgot to lock the camera down in case you were 
catching that. All right, so I've got a, a focal, I've got a little null here that, let me just move this right in front of his face. So if we want to do, this is a pretty realistic amount of, uh, of DOF in my opinion, but I don't know, like if you want to go crazy with it, all you have to do is go over to the uh, Circle of Confusion, which just sounds like a Genesis song, and uh, bring that up to maybe like four, something like that. And I'm in progressive mode, uh, in case you were wondering. And there it is. I mean, it's 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 there. We've got bokeh, bokeh achieved, or bokeh. I'm I'm never gonna get used to saying it that way. You can change the blade count. You can change the aspect. Let's say you want to make it look more like uh, anamorphic. I might try like a point seven, something like that. Get more of like an anamorphic bokeh, bokeh. Uh, you can also load in your own image, right? So this is pretty rad. You can actually load in a custom image in your bokeh. Again, never going to get used to saying that, but whatever, man. I'm, I'll try it. Uh, and I have a whole library. I'm not going to get into it now, but I have a whole library. I can show you, like, you know, cool ways to use that. Let's actually bring this up even more. And, um, oh, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a macro shot now. It's a macro shot of our bot. So let's render this out in bucket mode, because right now, progressive mode, you can see it looks pretty grainy. And that's probably because I've got a pretty low amount of passes in my progressive uh, so if I switch this over to bucket mode now, and we let it do its thing, um, it's going to do the point cloud first, and then it's going to chew through this render. I mm -mm -mm. wonder how many actual settings I have, or how many samples I have on this guy. Probably not that many. Only, only 256. So uh, I, I think that I'm probably going to say that that's probably not going to be enough samples right off the bat. In fact, I'm going to turn off this and I'm going to make sure my output size. Yep, cool. And I'm going to, we're going to render this actually out to the picture viewer and that'll be a little bit easier to see. So let's remember we're doing bokeh, so we're going to have to have a bit more samples in our min. So let's try, I don't know, 64, 512. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and render this out to the picture viewer and see how it does. So right now it's loading to the radiance. It's going to generate the radiance point cloud. Another thing to remember too is that, uh, whoa, why is it so dark? That's super bizarre. It's almost got like the wrong gamma on it or something. I'm going to escape and close that and send it again. And hopefully it was just some sort of odd oddity. Uh, another thing to remember too, Redshift kind of shares the um, the load with your CPU. Yeah, it must have been some sort of weird glitch there. Now the gamma looks correct. Um, so what that means is that it's not necessarily as important that you have a graphics card with a ton of memory on it because it can share that load with your CPU. So that's why I think a lot of people in production like using it because it's actually really great in that you don't have to worry about all the machines having 10 1080 TIs and there are five or whatever. So it, it <clears throat> it's a little bit more forgiving that way. All right. Ah, uh, all right, we'll let that go. You can see already um it's not it's not going as fast as I would like because um this scene was actually optimized not for this kind of style of of bokeh. So bokeh, like I said before, takes a lot more um, samples in the, in the min and the max, which we kind of didn't build it that way. We built it, we put a lot of samples in the, in the, uh, in the dome light. Well, it's actually not that many, but I, I, if I was going to do something like this, where I was going to rely a lot more on the adaptive, I would lower the, um, I would just lower all of the, uh, all of the settings down. And again, you can do that really easily by going in here and saying reflection and let's just say a replace. So we're going to give it eight uh, glossies. We're going to give the lights all eight. Um, we don't have any volumes in here as far as I know. I'll go over volumes maybe in, a, in the next one. Um, or maybe if somebody has a question about it, I can talk about it. Um, okay, so that's a little bit more optimized, I think, for what I want to do. Um, let's go ahead and raise our max. And I'm just going to regionize and just see if that feels any better. Yeah, that definitely feels faster already. I just want to see if that's cleaning up any of the bouquet.
which it is. Let's just go ahead and make sure these guys can also be lower. So I'm actually going to go down pretty damn low. And for this guy, I don't think we need that many bounces. Probably could get away with just two. And now let's go ahead and render that again. And that's going to be quite a bit faster. <clears throat> well, I think um, we're approaching the hour mark. And that is kind of what I wanted to do is just kind of show you guys, give you guys like a really brief, quick, come on over, meet Redshift, shake its hand, say hello, see if, see if you like it. Maybe you've already been using it. Hopefully I showed you something new. Maybe you're completely new to it. I don't know. But anyway, that, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into the, into the uh, chat real quick here. So I hope you have your questions ready. Uh, because I'm ready to answer them. I got time. Let's do it. Let's jump into the questions. Um, thanks for coming. If, if, you, um, uh, if you like what you're seeing, make sure you subscribe and, and check out our schedule and, and watch all of our streams. I'm going to be doing a lot more of these. In fact, I, I thought I could get through a lot more than I, than I did, um, but you know, time has a way of getting away from you. So uh, yeah, dude, let's jump into the Let's jump into the chat and see what you guys have to say. All right. So, uh, 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 Zer, Zerge, Zerge edits. If you had to choose Octane or Redshift, what would you prefer? Uh, Redshift. Absolutely. Um, I just really enjoy the uh, production features and the ability to cheat and the ability to put samples where I want. And I didn't even get a chance to talk about AOVs and volumes and passes and proxies and all this stuff that we're going to have to do streams about because there's so much to go over. It, it really, it really is a lot. Um, I don't hate Octane. Come on, Scott. It's not my favorite. I don't, hate is a strong word. I don't like that word. Um, I don't use it. Um, anyway, uh, this will be going to YouTube, um, probably in a week, maybe less, uh, hopefully less. Um, anyway, uh, Merck, Merck Vilson is in here and Merck Vilson, if you don't know who that guy is, you should, because he is a crazy talented guy, always putting out these crazy gift tips and stuff, and he knows a lot. He gets so deep into Redshift that my mind is just constantly blown by the insane stuff that that guy does. So check out his stuff. Is the unified sampling in Redshift similar to the adaptive sampling approach in Octane? Yes, it is similar. Uh, it is similar. I think um, uh, unified sampling is a bit more robust, in my opinion. Um, oh, so here's a good one. Uh, Jay Smart wants to know, so is it GPU and CPU? Yes and no. That's not really clear. I understand that. But fundamentally, at its core, it is a GPU renderer. It is not doing any of the rendering on the CPU. However, it is using the CPU to kind of balance the load. So there is that aspect to it. But it, it, is, a, it is a GPU renderer strictly for NVIDIA CUDA cards, which I have four in my machine in case you guys were wondering or you came in late, whatever. So here's a good question. Um, Ma Ma Mo Mayo, uh, Mayo Maja, Moja wants to know, hey, Chad, what features of Redshift uh, would you really want to have in Arnold? And I would say off the top of my head, um, have Arnold be on the GPU would be absolutely number one. Uh, and number two, I really like the the granular controls in the dome light. I really like that, being able to adjust the saturation, have the back plate right in there, that sort of thing. I dig that. I dig... Uh, those are like the main two that come to my head. What is a close approximation to Red, in Redshift to Arnold's GI? Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, that question. I mean, Redshift is a is a biased engine, which which you could use brute force. Brute force is primary, second, and secondary. But that's kind of like why. Um, so it's a bit more of a. Uh, it, it's it, it's probably a little bit less accurate in terms of the GI um, math than Arnold. But hey, you know what? Like that's that's a biased renderer. That's the beauty of it because you don't need all that accuracy all the time. I mean. It, 
It's really, it, it, it's about speed. It's about getting that frame out. It's about being able to throw a lot at a uh, throw a lot at your render and not have it completely, you know, kill your machine. Um, so cheating is good. Uh, is the multi pass in Redshift good? So I kind of deliberately didn't show you the AOV workflow in Redshift because they're they're currently working on it and it's going to be changing, I think. Uh, but right now, it's not my favorite right now, but I have been told that they're working on a fix and they're working on making it awesome. And so when that happens, I'll show it off for sure. Um, it's not as deep uh, right now. Currently, it's not as deep in terms of being able to create custom AOVs and all that sort of thing as Arnold is. Uh, but it is robust and it has, you know, puzzle map passes and all the passes that you're used to having. And the beauty of it is it doesn't require completely center, a completely separate render uh, to do it. It can do it all in all at the same time, whereas like some of the passes in Octane require a completely different render process. It does not. It's just like Arnold. It rendered, it does the passes at the same time. Uh, can you stack textures? No, you cannot stack materials in, in Redshift. You would use like a blend material and mats and things like that. Um, uh, you, it's not like the typical kind of C40 like stacking. Um, is Redshift just as noisy as Octane? No, actually, it's really, really clean. Uh, that's the beauty of the unified sampling and it being biased. It is really, really clean. Um, I didn't have time to show you guys this, but... I'm going to anyway. You know what? Screw it. Let's let's open up this other scene. I really want to reiterate how um, how important I think Redshift is to people that are doing interiors. So I have this interior scene here uh, that I wanted to show you guys, and I'm just going to let this I'm just going to let this load up here, and let's do uh, fit window. So Redshift is really killer at at doing interiors because of its its biased nature, um, where you can really tell it to just don't think that hard, and it, it renders much faster that way. So it's not it, it's not like a true path tracer. It's not like some crazy. It it it's just so good at it because it's the irradiance caching. Is very similar to V-Ray if you've ever used that. So if I go over here, the Radiance Point Cloud, rather. Um, see, I'm already using like old V-Ray terms. It's very similar uh, to how that works. So um, it's fast as hell for doing interiors. So this is right now I'm using um, uh, progressive mode. But if I come over to and I uh, change this to bucket mode, um, you're going to see it does the Radiance uh, Point Cloud pass, and then it's going to chew through this render in like no time. And um, so yeah, there there it goes doing its thing, and it's done. So this has how many bounces of GI in here? It's got seven bounces of GI, um, and yeah, it's got no issues with it. Uh, I haven't really fully optimized this, but it's it's pretty damn it's pretty damn fast. In fact, I'll go ahead and turn on uh, my environment. I'll go over this in a future stream, but I, I went on and turned on some some volumes in here. So I don't know how visible this is at home, but now we've got some God rays coming through the windows. I'm not sure. Let me see if I can like you know show you guys that. Hopefully you can see that. But we've got God rays coming through here, and it it's like yeah, no problem, man. You want some God rays in here? No no worries. We got you. Redshift's got you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that, and I'll probably go over that um, more in depth in a in a future uh, in a future uh, tutorial. But yeah, the the volumes are great. Um, I remember when I was I, I think I was at I think I was at Seagraph, and uh, Beeple was you know Beeple and I were chatting, and he was like, "So what's the deal with this thing? What's the deal with Redshift?" And I had it on my laptop, and I'm like, "Yeah, it's right here. You know, if you want to check it out." He's like, "Do me a favor, make a really small small light source, and make it really really bright, and then turn on like volumes." And so I did it, and I was like. Yeah, there you go. And he's like, that would kill Octane. Like, that would kill Octane right there. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. I mean, it, I don't think Redshift is really, a, really efficient that way. So doing that sort of thing in Redshift was like not a problem. I could clamp, I could clamp the um, the sampling as well. I didn't get get into that, but if we had an area of the frame, um, uh, well, here actually, let me just dive back in. So we're on this window right here. So if I come over to the um, 
uh, the basic tab here and I tell it, I'm already actually doing it, but if I didn't clamp this output, uh, sorry, the uh, sample filtering, leave this at like 10, let me just mouse over that. Um, you can see that, uh, wow, I forgot that I actually turned up that environment like scattering crazy bright. That's nuts. Let me turn that down. That's really bright, sun. So bright, too bright. Uh, and I'm just walking the, um, the, the in redshift environment uh, scattering down. Okay, so um, for instance, like we have an overbright situation right here. The pixels right here are overbright. In fact, if I walk over and say pixels, you're going to see we're getting RGBA values of like 2.5 or something like that. Well, um, that's when you start to introduce, that's when things like fireflies happen. That's when things like ratty issues happen on edges. So you can use this sample filtering over here to kind of clamp that down a little bit. Whoa, what just happened? That's weird. Just like all of a sudden like went away completely. All right, there we go. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. So right now I'm going to clamp it down. I'm going to clamp it down to, let's say, two. So now I'm telling Redshift the highest I'm going to let you go is, is a value of two. And now if you look here, none of that, no, I don't know how visible this is at home, but I'm mousing over these areas and they're much better. The sampling looks much better and it's kind of clamping it. Now this isn't awesome if you need that dynamic range in, in your shot, but it's a great way to kind of like, if you have a bokeh off in the background flaring out and like getting all grainy and whacked out, this is a great way to kind of fix that, bring these intensities down to kind of, you know, get a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, less grain, I guess. Um, so, uh, Kira wants to know, no flickering if you use brute force or use pre-pass of the radiance? No. Flickering is just not even, it's not even a thing. Like it's, I mean, I, it could be if you like lowered all the settings and like made it really jank, but it's, it would be really hard actually to, to get that happening. Um, so no, don't have to worry about that. It's, it's really, it, there's, there's none of, just that type of mentality, like, Oh my God, like V-Ray and, and, and blotchiness and flickering, just like cut that off right now and like throw that part of your, throw that away. That's just not, not, a, not an issue. Um, let's see. Does changing your samples in intervals of eight, uh, like 128, helpful to reduce noise? I know the ISO and cameras operate that way. Curious if it's similar. Um, no, uh, ISO is not going to do that for you. That's just going to be handled either in the, the samples of your lights, your shaders, all that sort of thing, your volumes, or in the unified sampling. Um, ISO is only going to do basically like exposure. It's going to either make it brighter or darker. I wanted to share um, where I got the mech model. So I got the mech model on TurboSquid. You can go check it out. It's the VMech uh, by Dmitriev Vasily. And the other thing, um, uh, I have a YouTube, uh, uh, I have a YouTube playlist that have all my favorite Redshift tutorials on here. And this one is really killer. This Houdini, a lot of them are for Houdini or Maya, but don't worry because a lot of the settings are completely transferable. So that's another resource. Um, another resource is the Redshift documentation, which I highly recommend checking out and reading and learning and just absorbing all of this information. Then the last one is going to be the Redshift forums, which is a great place to not only learn about new new builds, but post any sort of issues, post your favorite render that you did. Uh, so these are like the best, these three things like YouTube, there's a lot of great material out there, um, the manual and whatnot. All right, well, guys, it was a blast. Thanks for, for coming out. Thanks for hanging out. So many people uh, showed up to this. I'm so stoked that y'all come out, came out and hung out and got to meet Redshift and at least kind of just like sort of get a glimpse of it. Thanks for coming, guys. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we'll see you, see you on my next one. Bye, guys.